Um, we will have the Dharma message by Sensei Janice. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy New Year. It's really nice to be out here. I am going to share my screen. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida. So today I'm going to be talking about the antidote for not enoughness. I'm going to be talking about an illness, one that infects almost every person at one time or another. And no, I'm not talking about COVID-19 or the common cold or the flu. This ailment is something that I call not enoughness, and it creates much of the unhappiness in our lives. So what is not enoughness? Not enoughness is the name I made up for an all too common feeling. It's the feeling that you're not acceptable, that you're not okay the way you are, that you are in some way inadequate or bad or a failure. A feeling that could be summed up by the words, I am not good enough or I am not enough. It's not that most of us are walking through life saying out loud, I'm stupid, or I'm inadequate, or I'm worthless. But even if we don't necessarily speak the words out loud, those thoughts can run as a subconscious undercurrent just beneath the surface of our everyday lives. They are sneaky that way because they are there, but lurking out of sight. Even though that makes that harder to see, uh, our feeling of, not enoughness, we can still spot it and recognize its presence. Here are some ways it appears. It might take the form of pushing yourself constantly to work harder, to achieve more, or to be more successful in order to get better grades, earn a promotion at work, or make more money. It could be the competitive desire to do better than someone else, or that feeling of envy when you see another person's success. Maybe it's when you hear the nagging voice of self-criticism and self-doubt in your head saying, you should have done better. Or that feeling of not enoughness could come out in what we don't do. Not applying for a promotion, not resisting when someone treats us badly, or not taking care of our health. Where does not enoughness come from? We aren't born with this feeling. A newborn isn't aware of external expectations or judgments. It doesn't feel any need to meet them or resist them or to feel bad about them. A baby is purely and simply itself. It expresses its wants and needs immediately and loudly without fear of judgment. An infant doesn't think, if I start crying at the top of my lungs in the middle of the night because I'm hungry and I wake my mother up, She'll be mad at me, and that means I'm a bad person. No, not enoughness is not something we're born with, but it's something we learn. That learning process begins very early in our lives. As babies grow older, they soon develop awareness. We become social creatures, aware of the existence of other human beings and responsive to their actions. We learn from our parents, families, and other caregivers and later on from our teachers, our peers, and from society as well, that they have expectations for what we should do and that it is our job to fulfill them. 
These expectations or demands come to us in various ways. Some may be stated in words, in rules like boys don't cry, or in specific criticism of you or your behavior like you're always so noisy. I think my mom would say yakamashi. They might be conveyed through a disappointed or angry look, a tone of voice, or even physical violence. They could be communicated through things that aren't done, like not listening to you, or ignoring you, or neglecting you. The messages each of us receives may differ based on the culture and time period we live in, our individual family circumstances, and our personal characteristics. But they are all around us, and as pervasive as the air we breathe, bombarding us from every direction, including from our parents, our peers, our teachers, advertising, social media. Of course, not all the messages we get have the potential to make us feel bad. We get plenty that are helpful. But right now, we're looking at the problem of not enoughness, so I want to talk about how the unhelpful messages operate. How does not enoughness cause unhappiness in our lives? As a child grows up, they are bombarded by these messages that tell them they need to act a certain way, look a particular way, do specific things, be a certain kind of person. And as we all know, children are like sponges. They notice everything and absorb it all. As very young children, we depend on our parents not only to take care of us physically, but also to give us love and approval. We can't risk losing that. So from a physical and emotional survival standpoint, a child's only conceivable response to the expectations and demands of our parents is to comply, to do what they want rather than what we feel like doing. So we adapt by obeying and stuffing down the part of ourselves that doesn't want to follow those messages. And if we can't, won't, or don't do what is expected of us, we blame ourselves. This sets a pattern for the rest of our lives, prioritize external demands over what we truly want. There's another source of not enoughness that I need to acknowledge. Apart from the expectations that are placed upon us regarding the things that we do, there is also the not enoughness that comes from being, being viewed negatively by others for who we are or who they perceive us to be. This can be especially toxic and harmful negative or even supposedly positive but nevertheless harmful expectations or messages can be directed at you based on the basis of factors such as your race, ethnicity, gender, gender expression, or socioeconomic status. The messaging can come from society at large, for instance, the stereotype that Asians are passive or the idea that females aren't as good at math and science as males. I, for example, I had a friend who told me that their high school teachers declared that they were, quote, not college material because they were black. What messages did they receive from that? That they were inferior because of the color of their skin, that they were not smart enough to go to college, that they were not going to be successful. This person did go to college and to law school and went on to become a judge. This person who had been told they were not college material was appointed to the board of trustees of their college. Yet the stamp of this early judgment of unworthiness was a trauma they remembered with bitterness and continued to carry with them. Unfortunately, while the messages we get are external, coming from outside us, we internalize them. We absorb those expectations or those beliefs and the assumptions underlying them and make them a part of our own internal belief system. So even if the person who first gave me that message is no longer around, I nevertheless have an internal critic inside me that is still repeating it to me. We have been relentlessly programmed from all these, these inputs to meet these expectations, to believe these messages, to obey these rules, to accept the labels put upon us, whether we want to obey them or not, whether they are reasonable or not, 
whether they are safe for us or not, whether they are true or not. If I don't meet the expectations placed on me, I feel that I have failed, that I was not good enough. Or if I just exist in the world as part of a group that has been marginalized and am therefore treated as less than, I feel myself to be inferior or dangerous or unacceptable. In our minds, we lose any distinction between what we do and who we are. What I did is not good enough is transformed into I am not good enough. It becomes our story. Obviously, not enoughness feels awful. It makes us unhappy. It can make our lives miserable. Who wants to feel that they're inadequate or a failure or despised? So not surprisingly, we do whatever we can to try to stop feeling bad. Unfortunately, the strategies we commonly use to do this are false cures for not enoughness. When we're told that we're not good enough, one thing we might do to stop feeling bad is to try to fix ourselves by doing it over, trying to be better, or attempting to be perfect. This is our automatic response to the perceived consequences of failing to meet expectations. So our internalized inner critic scolds us, and then we flog ourselves into working harder and trying to do more or better we try to compensate for our feeling of not enoughness by overachieving. We, and society, might even tell us that this is normal, that everybody needs some motivation. We might even be praised for it. I think about the Japanese Americans who, after World War II, overachieved and assimilated to such an extent that we were labeled the model minority. There are certainly many high-performing, successful people who maybe got where they were by pushing themselves to try to be perfect. But in the end, that is a losing game because no one can be perfect all the time, right? You're just setting yourself up for failure and an endless loop of feeling bad about yourself. And all that striving and effort can become too much. It's exhausting. Even people who appear the most accomplished and successful to the outside world can feel themselves to be not enough failures. Sadly, sometimes we hear about such people who seem to have it all, but who take their own lives because in their own mind, they are nothing. Another way of coping with that feeling of not enoughness is to escape by consuming in order to fill up the emptiness or numb the pain of feeling inadequate. Some people might accumulate material possessions. They buy more and more things cars, jewelry, clothes, to make themselves feel better or to look more successful. Others may take refuge in activities such as playing online video games, gambling, or self-medicating with substances like alcohol, tobacco, drugs, or food in a fruitless effort to distract themselves. But turning to materialistic consumption or to addictive behaviors is also a false cure for not enoughness. They're distractions. They can temporarily make you feel successful or superior or fill the emptiness inside you for a short time or distract you and numb the pain of feeling that you are inadequate. But these activities create a vicious cycle. You are trying to satisfy a need that cannot be filled and so you are doomed to keep craving, consuming or self-medicating to relieve that craving and you feel better, but that wears off and you feel even worse and you start the cycle all over again. A third and maybe even more destructive re reaction to, is to act out by taking it out on other people, transforming oneself from a victim to a victimizer. Someone might treat others badly to make themselves superior or to distract themselves from the pain and hurt of feeling they are not enough or as a reaction to the trauma that they have been subjected to in their lives. We've all encountered people, maybe on the freeway, in line at the grocery store, at our school or work, who seem like ticking time bombs, filled with rage. The result can run the gamut from rudeness, to bullying, to random cruelty, to violence. There are a lot of hurt, wounded people walking around in the world 
And you may have heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. I hope it goes without saying that acting out is not going to cure not enoughness either and will create its own vicious cycle of fomenting more violence, endangering people, and leading to potentially tragic results. So that's the problem of not enoughness, what it is, where it comes from, how it causes unhappiness in our lives, and why our usual attempts to make it go away don't work. But what does Buddhism have to offer to those of us, which is probably everyone, suffering from the illness of not enoughness? I think it does have something to offer us. I believe it can help us identify and address the root causes of our feelings of not enoughness. One of the fundamental concepts of Buddhism is non-self. Non-self is one of the three marks of existence, along with suffering and impermanence. That term, non-self, can be confusing. But non-self doesn't mean that I don't exist. Rather, it means I have no permanent, unchanging essence. What I think of as my self is actually just a collection of sensations, feelings, perceptions, inclinations, and thoughts that are constantly changing from one moment to the next. My mind wants to take those things and assemble them into something that it thinks of as my self. That is supposedly the permanent essence of me. If I believe I have a permanent, unchanging essence that is myself, I see myself as unique, separate, and independent from other people. I think that I control my life. But that is an ego-based perspective in which there is a me over here and there's everything else over there. This is a dualistic view of the world in which I see everything in life as being either one or the other, myself or others, good or bad, right or wrong, success or failure, superior or inferior, them or us. We pass judgments on things. We see the world as a place of scarcity, struggle, and competition. That kind of thinking causes suffering, causes me suffering, because it creates and reinforces a sense of separation and alienation between me and everything else in the world. When you look at the world in this way, you are vulnerable to the idea that you have to be perfect, the best, successful in fulfilling the expectations placed upon you, because otherwise you would be imperfect, the worst, failing to meet those expectations. This, this figure, this idea of the self that our mind has created and is attached to, is built upon these dualistic, externally imposed expectations, standards, and values that we have internalized. But we cling to them, even though they lead us to feeling not enoughness, because we've internalized them as part of the identity we have constructed for ourselves. It's all about me and protecting that self-identity. In that slide describing the feeling of not enoughness that I uh, put up earlier, all those phrases start with I, I, I. It's an ego-centered view of the world. However, if we adopt the Buddhist view of non-self, we see that there is no permanent, independent, separate me. Instead of perceiving the world in a dualistic way, we see the world through the eyes of oneness, understanding that everyone and everything is interdependent and interconnected. We understand that separateness is an illusion. In reality, everything we do affects others. In reality, our lives are made possible by countless causes and conditions. We don't do it by ourselves. Buddhism also shows us that we cannot cure our feeling of not enoughness by trying to make ourselves perfect or distracting ourselves from the pain of not meeting expectations. The first of the Four Noble Truths is that suffering is a fact of life, and the second is that the cause of suffering is desire or craving. The desire to be perfect, to earn love, approval, or success is a craving and it can, is one that can never be satisfied because perfection is impossible and external validation is uncertain. So we are setting ourselves up for disappointment and suffering. 
similarly trying to distract ourselves from the pain of not enoughness with consumption or compulsive behavior or addictive substances is also feeding a craving that cannot be satisfied and that only causes an endless cycle that leads to more suffering. Buddhism teaches us that the source of our suffering is not what happens to us, but how we react to what happens to us. So much of the time, we make judgments. We define things as good or bad, but life is more complex than that, far more complex than that. Things that are difficult and painful may be opportunities for growth or learning. People that we see as our enemies can become our teachers. When we understand that we don't see things, when we understand that, we don't see things in such a black and white way. We cannot control what happens to us, but we can change the way we look at things. We can choose our responses rather than simply react out of habit or conditioning. One way we can do this is by practicing mindfulness. It's a way to calm our minds so that we can step back from our emotions and our churning thoughts and see things more clearly. When we set aside time to sit quietly in the present moment with stillness and awareness, quieting the chatter in our heads, we can pause and step back from the expectations placed on us and the stories we have told ourselves about who we are. This gives us the opportunity to gain perspective and more skillfully choose our responses rather than simply reacting. In that way, we can reclaim our, our agency meaning our ability to decide how we will respond. One of the things we learn from Shin Buddhism in particular is that we are all foolish, ordinary beings, bonbu, who are full of greed, anger, and ignorance. So we know that perfection is not possible. In fact, if we think we can attain enlightenment through our own efforts, that just shows our spiritual arrogance. We know that we are flawed, and admitting that reminds us to be humble. That helps us set aside our judgments and view our fellow sentient beings with compassion and ourselves with compassion. When we let go of our ego and our dualistic sense that we are separate, independent entities, we can relax and be our true selves. Once we recognize that we are interdependent and that our lives are supported by infinite causes and conditions, we don't have to struggle so much because we no longer see life as a zero-sum game with winners and losers. When we recognize that we are foolish beings, we can let go of our desire for perfection and our search for external validation. Giving up our ego-driven striving can lead to freedom, the opportunity to live our lives more authentically. When you acknowledge that you're a foolish being, but don't judge yourself for it, if you understand that through the eyes of wisdom and compassion, you are accepted just as you are. Shinran Shonin, the founder of our tradition, knew something about the illness of not enoughness. He spent 20 years as a Tendai monk on Mount Hiei, studying Buddhism with great diligence. He realized, when he realized that despite his efforts, he had not yet reached enlightenment, he felt himself to be a complete failure. That was the point at which he left Mount Hiei and set off on a different path, becoming a student of Honen and following the Nembutsu teachings. This feeling of not enoughness, I think, is the turning point that enabled him to abandon the self-power idea of striving to meet external goals of perfection and enlightenment. It opened his eyes to the truth of oneness, the importance of being humble, and the wisdom and compassion of Amida Buddha. Is it easy to pursue this antidote to our not enoughness? It is not. It is hard to push back against the expectations, the programming, the messaging that we've been bombarded with since infancy. It's hard to give up the illusion that we can just do better or be perfect, and if we do that, we will be acceptable. It's hard to close our eyes to the temptations of consumption, materialism, and substances that say to us, I can help you escape your pain. It's hard to give up our ingrained mode of working harder, trying to be better, aiming for perfection that was our security blanket 
the only way we knew how to feel accepted and validated. It's hard work, but at the end is awakening, freedom, and authenticity. The mind of not enoughness is dualistic and self-centered. It accepts the external messages and expectations imposed on us and adopts it as a part of our identity. It is insecure because it relies on external validation from others that might not ever come. It is reactive, acting out of insecurity, social conditioning, and habit. It is the mind of resistance, telling us that life is a fight, and if we only work harder, we will eventually be worthwhile and acceptable. The mind of the true self, on the other hand, knows that we are all in interdependent. Because it understands that truth of oneness, that our lives are supported by and a part of everyone and everything in the universe, it does not see us as being separate from other beings. And so it extends compassion to others and to ourselves as well. The mind of the true self is not bound by external expectations or reliant on approval from outside ourselves. It is free to be itself, naturally. It does not react blindly out of conditioning or habit, but pauses, reflects, and chooses responses, its responses skillfully. Instead of fighting with the world, the mind of the true self sees and accepts reality as it is. Which one do we want? Which one do you want? Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namanda Butsu. Namanda Butsu. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to try and close out my screens. I just got to figure out how to do that. <laughs>